The boy holds his lucky bell and stares out into the growing dusk. Night is coming, and with it the promise of monsters worse than anything his father has ever described in his campfire stories. Rumors of endless massacres terrify him, and he hopes his mother and father will soon return. They heard a radio broadcast promising safety to those hiding, and they left with others to investigate. He spent the whole day staring at the dirt road leading out of the village, waiting for them to return. A few returned with wounds and horror stories. Endless stories of death, destruction, and mayhem. He didn't understand any of them. They hate us. Why? Why do they hate us? Because the radio and the television tell them to. What did I ever do to them? You were born in newly created Nigeria. That's what you did. You were born a northerner. His grandmother approaches. Did you see anything out there? Philip shakes his head. If you see anything, if you see danger, ring your father's bell and hide with the others. Philip nods and stares at the bell. Will they come back? His grandmother hesitates for a long moment. I don't. I don't think so, Philip. They're hiding. Tears fill his eyes as his grandmother disappears into a small thatched home. He feels a tear slip down his face, and he knows, just knows, he will never see his parents again. Grandmother Abigail hasn't smiled for days. A terrible smell of rotting flesh drifts into their village. She tells Philip is the stench of decomposing cows. Philip nods, but knows she's just trying to protect him from the truth. He heard the elders talking by the well. So many dead. They are burning the bodies before there is an investigation. Who is burning the bodies? Killing crews. Human butchers. Men paid to make his people disappear, as though they were an infestation of cockroaches. A deal with the devil for money. He hates them all, and tries to sleep, but can't. All he can do is stare at the door, where he hopes against hope to see his parents again. But he knows. They're never returning. And all he has left is Grandmother Abby. Abby approaches him and lies beside him. He leans his head against her and closes his eyes and cries. He hears her open her mouth to say something, but no words come out. He opens his eyes and she's crying, silently. Before he can say anything, a bell rings. Her face grows hard as she grabs him by the wrist and leads him outside to a hatch. A moment later, they're underground with the muted sounds of slaughter vibrating through the ground. He squirms in Abby's embrace. She holds him tighter and tighter as cries and shrieks swell into an unbearable pandemonium. He never realized humans could emit such sounds. It's all he can do not to scream himself. He squirms, and Abby covers his mouth just in case. Silence. Horrible, gut-wrenching silence. Philip shifts uncomfortably in her makeshift bunker and listens for something, anything. Abby nudges him. I see your mask, Philip. Mask. She's trying to distract him from the hell outside. Six plus twenty-four minus eight. He works it out. Twenty-two. 
She smiles and nods. She levels another challenge and another. He answers with growing tears in his eyes. She touches his face. Don't think about what is happening outside. Listen to my words and play the game. He nods and tries his best to work out her challenges. But he can't help but think about his mother, his father. They said mass would strengthen his brain, make him good in school, give him all kinds of opportunities his father never had. His father. He'll never do maths with him again. Never play chess with him again or hear his stories. And why? Because of men who take money to do the devil's work. Abby nudges him. Philip asks her to repeat the challenge, just as the cry of a toddler rips through the silence. He instantly looks to his grandmother. Her eyes go wide as she stands and approaches the ladder. Philip runs to her and grabs her hand. Don't go. Please. Please. She hesitates, staring at the hatch above. I cannot leave the boy out there alone. Philip nods and wants to hold her soft, wrinkled hand forever. But he lets go and watches her as she bravely ascends the ladder and disappears into the scorching day. Hours, days, weeks. He's not sure how much time has passed. His eyes never left the hatch as he repeated countless math problems in his mind to avoid facing the truth as she has disappeared with the rest of his people. He hears her voice, her laugh, her sighs. He wants to see her again. He wants to see his parents, his friends and neighbors. He wants to see them all, but he knows. His life will never be the same again, and he would rather be dead than live without them. He closes his eyes and ascends into the cool night. The smell of rotting humanity instantly assaults his senses. Reminds him of roadkill left in the sun for days, only worse. He searches the moonlight ground and soon finds his father's bell by the charred remains of a body. What happened? You were supposed to keep a lookout. You were supposed to warn us. He takes the bell and cries out for his grandmother in a raspy whisper. But the whisper turns into an endless scream. He screams until he loses his voice. And all that answers back is the deafening silence of the cold, indifferent night. He falls to his knees taps his bell with his finger and wishes he could just disappear from this living nightmare. Village to village, it's always the same scene. Death and destruction, burnt cars, homes, and bodies. His people disappearing in a seemingly endless mixture of fog and smoke. He can't move anymore. He doesn't have the strength or will. The smoke stings his eyes. The stench makes him want to retch with every inhale. But most of all, he can't take the silence. The horrible silence. The oppressive, dreadful, indifferent silence. He stops and sits by a tree with a vulture hovering close to him, waiting for him to die. This one wants his meat fresh, raw, not burned or doused in kerosene. He closes his eyes for a moment and drifts away, far away, but soon he hears a voice, a voice like his mother's. He opens his eyes to see a woman several muddy children staring at him. 
the mother extends an open hand. You must come with me. Philip doesn't answer. He can't answer. There's no warmth or wetness in his mouth. His throat is like sand. His eyes are like tar. The woman hands him a flask and he drinks as though he's never had water before. She tells him her name is Funanya and that he should come with her. I don't want to run anymore. I want to die. The mother keeps her hand extended. And that is why he must live. He must live to tell others what happened. To bear witness. Philip stares beyond the woman and fixes his gaze on one boy and two girls. He takes Flananya's hand, and together they trudge into the thick smoke and fog, refusing to be disappeared. Philip enters a home that has been ransacked by killing crews. There's blood splatter on the walls and a dark familiar stench. Philip doesn't want to think about what happened to the owners. For a moment he sees his mother approaching him. But then she disappears to reveal Funanya. She approaches Philip with some salvage school supplies. Sometimes drawing helps get you your mind off of things. Philip shakes his head. He doesn't want to draw, and he doesn't want to do maths. He doesn't want to do anything but wake up from this terrible nightmare. He stares at the other boy, Amika, as he draws a picture of his village. He has a dozen colors to choose from, but he only chooses black. Funanya doesn't understand why, but none of the colors appeal to him. It's as though he's stopped seeing color. Philip stares at the picture of the colorless village and steps outside where Nikki and Chica keep watch. He shows them his father's lucky bell, though he's not sure it's so lucky anymore. He hands it to Nikki, explains she should ring it if she sees anything. I hate the smell of kerosene. Bunanya nods and agrees with Philip. It's not the kerosene, but everything else attached to it. Nikki looks at Funanya and asks why the crews are burning everything. Funanya doesn't answer, and maybe she doesn't know. Philip turns to her. They are burning evidence. Nikki and Chica look at Funanya and she nods. Philip hears his grandmother's voice. Death plus destruction equals good business for devils disguised as humans. Philip grinds his teeth and answers the disembodied voice. They should all be killed. Those who pay for murder and those who profit from murder. Vinanya stares at him. Philip, don't say such things. They are trying to take our humanity from us and that is the one thing they cannot take unless we give it to them. Philip feels his face harden. I don't want a sermon. I want my family back. I want them to pay for what they did. Brunanya puts a hand on his shoulder. Pray to the angel of mercy that we survive so that we may bear witness. Philip stares past her at the growing night. I'd rather pray to the angel of death and watch them suffer. Forgive and be forgiven. I can't. I hate them. How can they take money to do such things? There will be justice, Philip. They will not get away with their crimes. Philip doesn't say anything. He doesn't say anything because, like his father, he believes that those with money, those who can afford killing crews and the quantities of kerosene required to burn humans by the thousands, can get away with any crime they choose to commit, even mass murder. She can pray for mercy all she likes. He'd rather pray for vengeance. 
those who profit from murder are worse than animals. He can't get the idea out of his head that people would do such dreadful things for money. If he survives this, if he escapes this scorching hell, he'll have his revenge. He can't help but share his dark thoughts with Funyanya, who says that an eye for an eye is not the way. That an eye for an eye would make the whole world go blind and plunge us all into infinite night. The world go blind. The world is already blind to what is happening to him and his people. To hell with the world. The world doesn't care. All this unrest and destruction was meant to happen. It was a mathematical formula to divide and conquer and rob his country of its beloved resources. He heard the elders say this a hundred times. Bunanya gives him more wise words from dead leaders, and he stops talking about revenge. For a moment, he thinks that maybe she's right. Maybe revenge is not the solution. Maybe the world will one day wake up from his slumbering indifference and help his people. Nikki hands Philip back his bell in the dark night. It's his turn to watch for killing crews, but he hasn't slept in days, and his eyelids are stones. He holds his bell close to his heart, and for a moment, just a moment, he closes his eyes, just for one minute. He awakens in the heat of morning with a start and a terrible feeling. He vaults to his feet and searches for his new friends. He finds one, pieces of one, of another. He's not sure. He hears someone moaning. He searches and finds Nanya, not dead, but dying. Sliced at every tendon, writhing in agony covered in something golden. Honey. They poured honey over her, and a million tiny black things swim, drown, and gorge on the gold and crimson streams dripping from her open wounds. The ants are crawling under her skin and eating her alive. He kneels beside her and tries to swap them away, but it's no use. They're everywhere. Funanya whimpers and sputters blood as she tries to speak, but her tongue is missing. And all that issues is a terrible rattling noise. Philip kneels before her. He doesn't know what to say or do. I fell asleep. I'm sorry. So sorry. But sorry doesn't put her back together again. Sorry doesn't get rid of the ants or bring back the children she was protecting. She barely scratches something with her finger in the dirt. I forgive. Philip stares at the words for a long moment. Silent tears fall as he raises his hand in front of her face. She closes her eyes and waits for her suffering to end. He doesn't want to do it, but he has to. He knows he has to. He closes his eyes and lowers his hand over her mouth and nose. And for a moment, just a moment, he becomes her angel of mercy. Philip enters another decimated village under the cover of darkness and sees a crew, a killing crew, maybe the very ones who killed his guardian. Maybe the very ones who killed his grandmother, his parents. No hell is good enough for these demons who would take money to disappear people. They're cooking something by a fire, laughing and making jokes at the expense of those they butchered. They talk about his people as though they were animals. Now, less than animals. 
No one takes pride or ridicules the animals they slaughter. He's never seen anything like it. Dogs without humanity. That's what they are. Dogs. Rabbit dogs. Nothing less, nothing more. Something ancient tugs at him. He feels darkness like a tendril from another world take hold of his young, innocent heart. Not young or innocent anymore. He hears Funanya's voice. Forgive and be forgiven. But he doesn't want to forgive. And he doesn't want to be forgiven. He wants them to suffer like they made his people suffer. He wants them to suffer for taking everything from him. He hears his grandmother's voice trying to distract him from his dark thoughts of revenge with infinite math problems. But over her voice is the raging, maddening heartbeat of his hate. Her voice screams out equations and challenges, but he glares at the man. He feels kerosene coursing through his veins, and he's ready to explode. An eye for an eye, and the whole world plunges in an infinite night. Good. Philip notices the guns by the jeep. He could grab one and shoot them all, but he's never used a gun, and they'd probably run away. He could find a knife or machete, but these dogs would overpower him. Just walk away, Philip. Never look back. It's your duty to survive and bear witness. He ignores the voices in his head and only wants one thing. He wants them to suffer, disappear. He wants to, yes, take their kerosene and make them disappear the same way they made his friends and family disappear in a swirl of smoke. And for a moment, just a moment, he is the angel of death, swooping through infinite night. <laughs>